In addition to just these basic group dynamics, a lot of this has to play out because of the phenomenon known as conformity. And so conformity is the idea that you are going to go with the group. And this is the idea you'll do everything you can to blend in and fit in with others. This means you will conform even if it challenges you and creates cognitive dissonance. And you will go with the group even if it challenges your attribution style. Even if you believe something was internal or external or you believe something was positive or negative. And you will change your attitudes and change your attributions just to fit in with the group. One very famous study was the study on conformity by Solomon Ash. And in Solomon Ash's study looked at determining if you could see which of a set of lines were the same. So we have up here in the upper right hand corner some lines. And you look at one vertical line on the left, and then you see three vertical lines on the right, A, B, and C. Can you determine visually which A, B, and C would be the same length as the line on the left? Are you able to determine? looks like a pretty easy skill, and this is representative of how difficult the questions were in Asha's study. However, what happened in this study was you weren't answering these one-on-one. -on -one. You were answering these in a group. In fact, you would answer these in a panel of seven participants in one group. So the researcher would hold up these cards, the left line and the three possible matches to the line, in a room of seven participants that were actually sat in a horseshoe or U-shaped round table. And one at a time, verbally and out loud, the participants would state either A, B, or C matched the line on the left. And there was a couple different trials. I think there was, in some variations, there was about 10 different trials of these lines. Now what happened here is there was actually only one participant in the study, six actors and one participant. And what happened was the first six of the seven people to speak were actually the actors, or what we call in psychology confederates. They were in on the study. They were working for the researcher. And then the true participant was the seventh person who sat at the end of the U-shaped table. And so with the first set of lines and the second set of lines, the actors or confederates answered truthfully and answered what line actually matched. But then on the third set of lines, all six of the confederates would answer incorrectly and with the same incorrect response. What happened here is if we use these demonstration lines, let's say it, they said A. So participant one, A, 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 A. Then it comes to the true participant's time. Is the true participant going to stick to what they know is right and stay C? Or are they gonna cave to conformity and say A? What Ash's famous study found was that they would all say A in that instance. If there was six actors all seeing the same incorrect response after they just gotten the first two trials correct, now they're going to say uh, the incorrect trial, the participants going to say, okay, there's something wrong with me. If they all think it's A, it must be A. I must be sitting at the wrong angle here. I'm going to say A. And then you continue on until about the 10th trial and every trial moving forward, all six actors would say the same incorrect response. And again, the participant would conform and they would change their answer to fit into the group. Now, after the original study, there was lots of variations conducted and Ash played around with this and other researchers have to adjust the amount of confederates in the room. Instead of six confederates, what happens if there is 10 confederates or three confederates or two confederates? And they actually found that conformity was more likely the more confederates were in the room, as long as they were consistent. There's also a variation in the study done. What happens if there's an accomplice in the room? What happens if, if there are seven individuals and six of them are actors, but on the third actor, the third actor will say the correct response. So it goes A, A, C, A, A, A. As long as one other person spoke up and said what the participant thought was right, the participant would not conform. As long as that voice of dissent came before them, they felt comfortable dissenting also. They weren't the one truly dissenting then, they were, they were supporting the original dissenter. And so it's the idea that we have a hard time going against the grain and going against the group. Now, not only will we want to go with the group, but we'll also want to obey authority. And so Stanley Milgram's famous study on obedience has really demonstrated how we bend to the will of an authoritative figure. And so in his study, it's, it's a bit complex, but what the participants truly thought was they were signing up to be in a learning study where they were going to work with another participant to learn about how we learn to match words and how our brain will adapt over time. And what the participant believed is they walked into a room and they drew straws or drew paper out of a hat 
And out of the two possible participants, one was determined to be the teacher and one was going to be the learner in this study. And they were going to teach each other and learn how you can learn different word matching skills. So that's what the participant believed. What was actually happening was that the learner was always an actor and always a confederate and the teacher was the true participant. So the true participant would show up, they thought they were drawing straws or doing a raffle, but they always got assigned to teacher no matter what. But they did that to make them perceive that it was 50% chance they were the learner or the teacher. In addition to the learner and the teacher, there was the researcher or the experimenter in the room, and they sat sort of what's going on in this diagram. So basically what's happening here is we have the E is the experimenter, that's the researcher, and they're recording what's happening. Then we have the T, who's playing the role of the teacher. And they're sitting in front of this large electronic device with lots of switches on it. And then the, the experimenter and the teacher go and they strap in the learner into a chair in the other room. And they're being strapped into this chair with some electrical probes on it into the other room. And now they can't see them, but there is a bit of a, a sound system so they can hear what's going on in the other room. And what the teacher believes is about to happen is they're going to tell the learner a few word groups and the learner has to pick the correct word from the word groups. It's sort of a anagram or analogy sort of study. And so what the teacher or true participant is told is when the learner gets something right, that's good. When they get something wrong, they are supposed to hit a switch on an electrical box and administer an electrical shock to their fellow participants. Now what goes on here is the way the study is, is it's completely scripted. And what the teacher believes or what the true participant believes is happening is about a couple times in, all of a sudden the learner starts getting things wrong and they need to administer a mild electric shock. But then they start to get lots of other things wrong too and the shocks start to go up higher and higher. And then the learner or fellow participant says, stop, I don't want to, I can't do this anymore. Stop please stop, I have a heart condition. And if the teacher protests, if the true participant says, okay, I don't want to continue going, the experimenter or researcher who's sitting in the same room doesn't stand up, doesn't raise their voice, but simply says, continue, please. The experiment requires that you continue. And by saying continue, please, is that enough to convince the true participant to actually continue administering a shock to a fellow participant who they could have been in their shoes. There's a 50-50% chance they would have been in their shoes. What's astonishing about this is all participants continue to administer shocks up to an extremely high shock level. And at the end of the electrical panel, there was actually a switch that said 450 volts and then just marked XXX. And so this was the idea that uh, some participants actually continue to administer beyond lethal shocks to the other participants. And as they made their way up that high, the participant began to scream, began to cry, and eventually would go silent. And eventually they would get their answers wrong because they didn't participate and they were completely silent. And the experimenter would tell the true participant to continue administering the shocks. And they did. So what was actually happening in this experiment? Well, okay, nobody actually had any electrical shocks. That part was faint. And the crying and screaming and, oh, I have a heart condition was actually completely recorded on a record player. Every single teacher or true participant heard the exact same footage on a record player. It's true that they did strap an individual into a chair in another room. However, that individual was never harmed. And so they sat in the other room and they administered the record player and made sure everything on that end worked technologically. They were a paid actor. So the teacher or true participant never actually was harming another individual, but they believed they were. Now what Milgram really wanted to argue with this was the idea that through very little coercion, just a sitting experimenter saying, continue please, the experiment requires that you continue, that was enough to make an individual obey to the level that they would harm and potentially kill another participant. A participant who they believed they had a 50% chance of being in their shoes. This study shocked the world. It appalled people, especially because the participants were screened for mental well-being. Again, they screened up people who were high in psychopathy. They screened up people who were experiencing mental health crises. And so these supposedly well-adjusted healthy individuals were doing drastically violent things to another person. Of course, there's been lots of criticisms of this study. 
one of the big criticisms is there was not ethical consent. People didn't know what they were getting into when they signed up for the study. They didn't know they'd have to flick a switch up to a lethal voltage. And there was some questions about the debriefing. Many participants afterwards had suicidal thoughts and felt very horrible about themselves because they believed they had the potential to be a killer after that. They felt like the, the study made them feel evil on the inside and they felt very vulnerable. So the study didn't have proper debriefing, proper way of helping the participants safely exit the experiment and readjust after that experience. Also, there's been claims of the invalidity of this experiment. Although Milgram tried to argue that this proved that all of us can be evil if we're told to just follow orders. It can make us all fall into police brutality or all of us become Nazi soldiers. Some people say that this might not be the case and that perhaps some of it was manipulated. Perhaps some of the participants actually knew it was fake and just went along with it. And they were, they caught on and they just felt like they were acting too. And so there is some questions about how authentic and how real this would be. However, it would be hard to replicate this study today because of the major ethical problems. We wouldn't be able to do it like this in, in today's world. But either way, these studies show that people tend to conform and they want to fit in with others. And it seems to be something that we as a species are really driven towards. Now you might be thinking, not me, not me. I wouldn't fall to the bystander effect. I wouldn't conform. I'm used to dissenting. And it's true. Some people are used to dissenting or used to displaying a certain level of deviance. So the lack of conformity could be explained as going against the norms. And so it's important to study the act of going against societal norms. Now researchers have defined this in a couple different ways. They tend to look at those who go against and reject cultural values. Some of the idea, you reject the idea of having to be a homeowner someday or having to get married. Or you might be rejecting not so much the cultural values, but the means about which you go about obtaining these cultural values and cultural goals. So this may be the idea that, yeah, you want to be a homeowner someday, but it doesn't mean you have to have the same type of job or the same type of college education in order to be able to afford your own home. Maybe you'll do something different to get there. And so deviance can play out in these different ways. However, there's been some types of researchers have proposed the idea that true deviance is often an illusion. And so this is the idea that most people who believe they're deviant, most people who believe they're dissenting are actually conforming. If you think back to when we talked about group cohesion and behavioral homophily, even a really aggressive and antisocial group of villains are actually not dissenting, but more so conforming to their own group. And this is the idea that over the generations, we've seen young adults form different types of subcultures and different types of countercultural movements. It's the idea that we had the beatniks and the hippies and the grunge and the punks and the hipsters. And there's different types of generational movements where we reject societal norms. But in doing so, we do it as a group and it actually becomes an act of conformity rather than an act of deviance. So in the early 1990s, if somebody were to wear a spiked mohawk with lots of facial piercings and they were the first person in their school or neighborhood to do it, that could be deviance. But by the 2000s, getting a little stud in your nose was not so much of an act of deviance, but an act of fitting in with everybody else. And so true deviance tends to be a lot more rare than we perceive it to be. And many people who appear to be counterculture are actually just subscribing to a very niche subculture. There are, of course, some exceptions to that. And one of the most marketed exceptions is individuals who are truly antisocial. And these are individuals who would be characterized as psychopaths. So these are individuals who are the serial killers or who were the mass murderers. And these are the people that are very unique and creative in their forms of terror against other individuals. Now, again, you could be actually displaying conformity by doing something atrocious against people. You could be joining a very violent cult or a very violent terrorist organization. And by doing so, you might actually be seeking out that social bond and behavioral homophily and support and validation. And therefore, it wouldn't actually be an act of deviance in the larger picture. There are, of course, some people who would be the leaders and the initiators who would be deviant. I like to use Batman's Joker as an example of this because not only was he a villain, but he was a villain who really strove for chaos and he really didn't like order in society. So I really saw him as a big marker of deviance. 
Of course, if you are the first person to really put yourself out there, be an activist and stand up for something, that act of dissent is an act of deviance. And this can be done for all the right reasons. For instance, Rosa Parks, obviously a big important display of civil disobedience and dissent. Martin Luther King, of course, another one. And so lots of different people have dissented in their own way at different points in time. And it's good when other people conform to that dissent and back them up. And so we saw in June 2020 how Black Lives Matter received a lot more support from white individuals than it historically had as people conformed to that. And there was critical mass inclusion behind the movement for the first time. And so it's important to understand that although a lot of us, when we think we're being deviant, we're not, we're just conforming to a new movement, there are exceptions. And those exceptions are the true rebels, the true activists, and the true visionaries among us. Everyday people can have smaller acts of dissent and smaller acts of individuality, but it tends to happen less often.